pledge allegiance and and we will uh, start our meeting. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the States, United of States of America. To the Republic for which it stands. One nation. One nation under God. God indivisible. Liberty, liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. This is the first of oh, roughly, I guess, 15 or so budget meetings. And we are honored to have, looks like the entire school system, but maybe just the Board of Ed and uh, the business manager and the superintendent here. Uh, what I will ask is anyone that will be speaking, please give your name to um, Monica Diamond, who's our secretary who is on, so she can give you, you know, proper credit for being at the meetings. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, I'd, I'd also ask um, to, our, to our board, all questions go through the chair. And uh, I would just ask because we are on Zoom and technology being what it is, you know, temperamental at times, that we do our best to have one speaker at a time. Um, that said, um, Dr. Compton, uh, whomever, either it's yourself or whomever will be presenting, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. I would just like again to say a special thank you to you as the chair, as well as to the finance board, also to first select uh, woman, Anne Marie, and to our Seymour Board of Education. I'm gonna start out first with an overview, then that's gonna follow with the budget analysis with Salvatore Bucci. And then we're going to finish up uh, with Mrs. Kristen Harmley, who is our finance board chair. Um, I would first like to start out and just say that I'm here tonight to represent the children of the Seymour public school system. Tonight is a very important presentation. It's to show you where we are and at the end of this presentation also, hopefully we can answer some questions and talk about a mitigation plan and where we are and how we're trying to resolve this one issue of the $839,000 deficit. We've made a lot of progress this week. We'll be giving you an update in regards to that situation at all as well. I also wanna say that we have put on an immediate um, budget freeze for the entire district, only spending what is absolutely necessary, always children first for the needed resources for special education children, as well as a classroom and our teachers. So I would also like to mention when you get an opportunity, I would like for this finance board to view our websites, each of our school districts, we have featured videos showcasing our four school districts. One of my conversations with the finance board chair, and I thought it was a great uh, compliment, great idea. He said, why don't you think about showcasing and marketing the Seymour Public School District? We've done that, we followed up. I think you will really enjoy the videos because it really shows what our schools are about, the quality of the school system, its existence since 1884, and truly what Seymour Public Schools has stood for. Uh, I'd also presented in a previous presentation and just remarked about, my gosh, uh, Seymour has made its mark. It's been a legacy in Connecticut with so many state athletic championships, state debate championships, and other academic honors, commendable national merit finalists, and so forth and so on. It truly takes a team. We're here tonight. I know that we can work this out. We're all gonna to work together. We're gonna to find solutions and we're gonna move on. Um, I would like to just very quickly just go through the uh, presentation, the PowerPoint very quickly. All of you received yesterday packets of the budget as well as this uh, short PowerPoint presentation. Um, Rob Dyer is with us tonight as well. Vonda Tensa, the associate superintendent also and as well as Mr. Bucci, besides our board members. So um, Mr. Dyer, if you would just pull that up for us, please, very quickly. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. You will go with the slides. Uh, the first one is just reiterating what our, again, our mission of the Seymour Public Schools is. And of course, it's always on our students as learners. Um, I would also like to move to the next slide and just mention about what is our vision and our strategic focus. And basically we have three goals. These goals will always be ongoing. It's about student engagement with curriculum. It's always the climate and culture and it's a community involvement. But I wanna really focus in on goal two, which is climate and culture and the role that social and emotional learning, the impact that it has had on our children during the pandemic from March 2020, even though I was not here at the time, I was in another state, but what an impact during the pandemic that our children have faced, that there have been wonderful strides made, great support through the, um, the ESSER funds in supporting social and emotional learning, and also what our outstanding staff administration have done as well in supporting this. I also want to mention in regards communication, as we know, that's an ongoing area of improvement. You can never market yourself enough about what your school system represents and why this budget is so important to us and to keep the quality of the school system in place. So I'd like to now move on and just talk about the budget core values. I know that this Seymour Board of Education, the current members, the past members, for many decades and a century have always, always put students first. As I always say, from the boardroom to the classroom, every decision that is made should be made on what is best for students. A community, a town is only as good as a school system. So let's not forget that. Economic development's gotta drive it, but your school system, people move to see more because of the school system. So I just wanna emphasize that. I want you to look down just at some of our goals in regards with a rigorous relevant curriculum, making sure the technology infrastructure, as you know, the one-to-one -one devices with Chromebooks, this was totally implemented during the beginning of COVID. And I will say the, school, the Seymour School District did a, a really good job. Now, as we move forward to the next slide, uh, you know, what are our challenges? And as I just mentioned, making up for learning opportunities, this is a problem not only in Connecticut, but across the nation. There were gaps of, of learning opportunities that some of the children, the gaps have not all been closed. If you'll look nationwide, as well as Connecticut, as well as Seymour, number one issue is still math. It's hard for parents to do everything at home and teaching math is not easy, but our teachers here in Seymour have done a tremendous job. But again, math is an area of growth. When you look about you know, the goals that are set by our Board of Ed and trying to meet the current economic realities of school funding, uh, I don't mean to um, upset anyone, but this can has been kicked down the road over the years in regards about budget increases because of staffing costs, contractual agreements, and so forth. But I just wanna mention that, I'm, I'm just gonna just mention it once, there was a miscalculation that was made by a former business manager where the fringe benefits was not calculated right. We are trying to resolve that issue. No money was stolen, just the money was not there, it was a miscalculation. So I just want to say we're finding solutions uh, as of today, we found around $300,000 in looking at ESSER II that can be put towards that deficit. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, these are the important budget considerations. Just kind of looking at where we are while we're coming in here tonight with a 6.9. I just want to make sure that you understand what our needs are for us to currently have what we currently have in the Seymour School District without cutting anybody besides just one year people who were one year people that was through ESSER funds because these grants did provide opportunity to put on additional staff, technology support and other opportunities and resources. But I just want you to keep in mind 
Uh, without the miscalculation, we would be coming in tonight asking for a 4.5. Now, as we just look in the past about expenditures, what I think sometimes the general public did not always understand, our teachers recently got a new contract. Our board went all the way to arbitration. I can tell you the contract was fair, it was very reasonable. In fact, other districts had a little bit higher percentage. And that is something that salaries and so forth go up, steps go up, and you have to be able to make that adjustment. With a certain percentage of town increase, that can be a problem. So let's go on to the next slide. This is just in regards to the immediate district actions of what we're gonna address. As I said, I took your advice, Bill, immediately we put on a budget freeze. We are reviewing every part of grants. We're very transparent. Uh, in fact, any people from the town office and leadership is welcome to sit at the table with us and look at these expenditures and exactly what we're looking at. So I just want to uh, bring a focus on that. Again, thinking out of the box, how can we totally get this resolved? And another area that I have to address based upon if the percentage that we do not get from this finance committee, then we have to consider attrition. Uh, that is first on the list. Okay, when you look at this pie graph, this is typical of any school district anywhere in the country. 79% and many places, 80% is personnel. So we've divided out the pie graph and just seeing the majority of a school district salary totally is personnel. And as I mentioned the other day, day to um, one of the colleagues, I said, you know, this is something first and foremost, folks, we have to have teachers in the classrooms. We have to be able to fund our teachers and we have to have principals, so forth. So there's our pie, pie graph. Okay, this is just a historical enrollment that is done by a lot of the Northeast uh, uh, states. Uh, Connecticut's always participated in this. It's always really good. Seymour's done it for many years. It really shows you the historical enrollment. Demographics is very important to look at over a, a trend and what is really happening with enrollment. So as we go down to the next slide on past this one, just looking at district enrollment. Basically, there are some years where there have been a trend of going down with enrollment some, and then sometimes you can have a class in which there are more children. Currently, we have around 79 children that will be coming into kindergarten for this next uh, fall term of 22-23. So this will show you, as you can read uh, with your handout, specifically where the enrollment is. Um, as enrollment goes down, you can't continually to hire massively and with staff, but you still have to have the staff that's needed, whether it's to meet an AP programs, whether it's to meet capsize requirements, no matter what, again, you've got to have teachers and the adequate number as well as special education. And I just wanna emphasize that while we're on this slide, special education is mandated by, as you know, federal law that we have to abide by their IEPs and what we need to do to serve those children first and foremost. Okay. Now, this was basically a dream list. This is not going to happen, but in reality, wouldn't it be great if it could? Definitely in future years, this needs to be goals and several things such as instructional coach, a math coach, a literacy coach. You know what? Several districts throughout the country have this. But this is something that our principal spent a lot of time and definitely wanted things to be considered. And some of this that's down here truly is needed. But like I said, where we currently are, we're not going to that dream list. Okay, that's still uh, another part of it. Uh -huh. 
Okay, this is really now just a grant funded in regards with um, our different grants. One of the things the school district did this year and last year with some schools was, was to provide the IXL software program. It's an excellent program for skills and it builds on grade level continuum. So it's an excellent program. Um, also just looking to with the non-staffing request for the operating budget in regards to our facilities. You know, we need to have a five-year facility plan, a 10-year facility plan. So that just addresses that. And here is what we're all about. It's all about student learning. And this is something, this is where we're here tonight because the future of Seymour rests in your hands. Let's not go backwards, let's go forwards. We need to have the best products. Your Seymour graduates have stood and made a difference in towns and communities in various states throughout this country. You have a lot to be proud of. It's always been an outstanding district. Let's don't, let's don't lower the standards. Let's have the quality of the education remain the same. And that's basically my pitch tonight. Um, I'm here. I feel there was a reason that I was selected to come to Seymour. One reason is because of many, many years of experience. And I'm proud to be here. And I'm proud to work for the Seymour Board of Education. And we're totally a team. And together we will make this work. I'm impressed. Um, with this committee tonight. I know the other last week when I met you for the first time, um, again, it was still the pleasure to say hello and I hope we can make a difference and I hope you will consider this budget. If not, other ways in which we can address to have the best percentage for our children. Thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, is there anyone Mr. Bucci or anyone else that would want to do any type of narrative or presentation or anything like that before we start in, you know, with questions and, and things such as that. I sure. think so if, if, if he could give a quick overview. That no, that's fine. That that's yeah. fine. As I said, I'd rather give and, everybody. And then Kristen Harmel. Then yes. your opportunity, you know, give give your opportunities, and I'm sure there are going to be questions. And and as we've done in the past, just to give a little a little history lesson, uh, you're obviously the biggest budget in the town, as you are as education is in most towns. So one of the things I would anticipate doing is is after our board digests everything and asks whatever questions, there may be other questions that surface. Uh, we may find we'd ask you to come back if we have a you know a bunch of different questions or because sometimes you just can't think of everything on the spot based on discussions and written materials so that said you know when and if that time were to happen um, you would get plenty of notice it wouldn't be anything no surprises would be pulled on anybody but go ahead mr bucci thank you bill um dr compton certainly covered um in fact <clears throat> The broad strokes of um, some of the actual budget numbers and the and some of the reasoning behind the budget as it's been assembled. The uh, overall ask here of 6.9%, as we said, if you isolate the recalibration piece, which is the piece relating to the fact that our current year um, employee benefits number is not running at um, a current run rate. You get to the four and a half percent that is really the genesis of this whole budget. For us, there are two component parts of that, uh, one of which affects both us and the town, which is that we've both provided a 12 percent placeholder for anticipated increases in our Anthem um, health insurance premiums. Uh, for us, since we basically occupy 70 percent of the total Anthem bill, uh, that number is upwards of you know half a million six hundred thousand dollars thereabouts, and the other component part is the fact that this year, as Dr. Compton um, said, you know we adopted a three-year teacher contract that provided for a 0.7 percent increase in each step, but everyone moved a step. A new step was added. A new step 14 was added, 
And so therefore, the average increase for every teacher in the district is roughly three to three and a half percent. In some cases, it's more. The, um, the great news for Seymour is that a substantial portion of the teachers in the district have been here for a very, very long time. Um, in, in many cases, 15, 20 years. That's wonderful for the students. That's terrible for a budget. Okay, so in our case, we have a disproportionate number, if you will, of teachers who are at the higher end of the spectrum. And when you add the employee benefit load um, to in the overall scheme of things, our budget essentially comprises $23 million worth of underlying salaries and $7 million of projected employee benefits, which includes your employee portion, your, your, your employer portion of providing health care, Social Security, Medicare, municipal employee retirement funds, HSA contributions. Um, we still have some employee buyouts from the days when um, teachers who were here prior to 2007 were able to opt out of the health insurance plan and take the lump sum payment each year. And we're still carrying roughly $300,000 of those payments. So, which actually, by the way, might be something to consider down the road in terms of perhaps trying to induce some of our employees who are on your plan to perhaps maybe um, consider a buyout. When you consider that an employee electing family coverage under the plan, uh, given the percentages here, can cost us roughly $35,000 just for one employee. So it's a very heavy load. But again, that contributes to the 79% that Dr. Compton referred to in the pie chart. Um, it's not out of um, sync with just about every other school district. It, in fact, I think we're probably a point or two lower. The rest of this budget, for all intent and purposes, is flat. There's approximately $2 million in the budget for transportation, and that's currently our budget. We are going to be undergoing a negotiation for a new busing contract for next year. The district is prepared to live within whatever it is that we come up with. The busing company's already given us an indication that in order to get an adequate number of bus drivers, they may have to raise salaries, which of course increases the cost to us. The amount of money we've provided for, uh, inf for you know, infrastructure, and utility costs, roughly 2.3 million is, only reflects a modest increase over where we are now. We, like you, are contemplating that perhaps Eversource is going to raise rates um, a, at, at, a, at a level at which it's going to place a burden on us and on you. Uh, we are also looking at trying to get our arms wrapped around the cost of special education, which is always a moving target. We can't control who moves into the district. We, to a certain degree, can't really control who is entitled to the services that we have to provide out of district. And therefore, those tuition costs and schooling costs, um, every year we review them. We submit a preliminary estimate to the state for an excess cost recovery grant on December the 1st. We follow that up in, in March 1 with a secondary estimate um, and by that point in time, you have a pretty good idea of what you might recover. Last year, the district recovered 675,000. We're projecting this year, we're going to recover pretty much the same amount of money. And the way the formula works in case, you know, and I don't, is in case anyone wants to know is, we would bear the first 72,000 or thereabouts, that changes each year, of every student who comes in the district. So if you start with 22 students and you end with 22 students, but you have a plus, a minus two and a plus two, it really cost you $150,000. So it's not necessarily a situation that can remain stable. Um, but on the other hand, there are statutory requirements in special education that we are very mindful to keep um, in compliance with. Um, aside from that, I would say that um, there are really no other items in this budget that um, as Dr. Compton said, she had her wish list there that was submitted by each of the principals in each of the schools. None of those items are included in this budget. This budget really 
um, promotes that to, to keep the existing staff that we have in each of the schools um, and to essentially comply with the contractual obligations that we have to that staff, as well as attempt to um, find sufficient funds to keep the infrastructure going and to be able to provide the necessary resources. The last comment I'll make is, um, we are doing everything we possibly can to maximize what will be expiring grants. We have two grants that are expiring one next year, one the year after. They're both ESSER-based grants. Um, they provide for it, it, these grants, you know, the, tech, the terminology is you can only supplement, you can't supplant. You can't take LEA expenditures, local LEA expenditures that you were incurring and shift them to a grant. There has to be a supplemental service or product that you are, um, incurring expenditures for in order to use these grants. So as Dr. Compton referred to earlier, we are looking at these grants for the purpose of um, trying to mitigate our current year problem. Um, but we are also looking at these grants and the remaining time on these grants to buttress the school technology. Uh, my understanding is that we provide new Chromebooks to first graders and seventh graders and um, Chromebooks are on an obsolescence uh, schedule uh, by design. And so we're looking to use those grants to perhaps um, purchase some of that technology, provide some instructional learning to provide for the um, efficient sanitation of our schools, et cetera, et cetera. But we're being very careful not to develop a cliff scenario where when these grants run out, we now have expenditures to bring back into the LEA. That's not going to happen here. We've been managing that process uh, very diligently. Um, so that is my presentation, and um, I appreciate the time and the opportunity to make it, and I thank you again all for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, Kristen Harmley, our finance board chair. Hi, thank you guys so much, and thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I have a, a few prepared comments, that, so I, forgive me if it sounds like I um, am reading to you, but I did want to be uh, buttoned up for tonight. So the past few years, we've really seen our town, um, in my view, make an amazing progress on restructuring our debt, on sharing services between the town and the school, um, and generally holding the line on expenses as we've collectively struggled through COVID, economic volatility, and massive economic and sociopolitical uncertainty. So for these and more reasons, it's been a good number of years since we've had to um, engage with this board and with our community to talk about a sizable increase in our budget. Because all of those factors I just talked at, we, we approach things with a, we, we have to just keep holding the line. And absolutely those ESSER grants during the past few years have helped us maintain and improve the level of services um, for teachers and students to get us through this difficult time. So I know that we have a long way to go and we are on step number one of budget deliberations and quite frankly, negotiation. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. It is a negotiation. Um, what can we give? What can we take? Where can we collaborate? Where can we cut and jointly come up with ideas on how to save? So my ask of you here tonight is to support us in minimizing misinformation and the kinds of sweeping generalizations that are easy to say and nearly impossible to implement. These have already started to rear their ugly heads. Um, and it takes me immediately back to the days where we were road showing budgets to PTAs and to um, the senior center because every year felt like a fight when our school budget was failing two, three times in referendum. Um, but already just with one article in the Valley Indy, these same things are coming up again. Um, people saying things like, get rid of all your overpaid staff. I would say, who, who are those people? I don't know who they are. Um, we don't need two superintendents. We don't have two superintendents. We've never had two superintendents. We have a superintendent and an associate superintendent, just like almost every district does, just like every pilot has a co-pilot. That's what we have here in Seymour. Get rid of all the fluff. I'm gonna hearken and echo exactly what Mr. Bucci said. Even our wish list doesn't have fluff in it. There is no fluff in our budget. There never has been. Um, the Board of Ed needs to tighten its belt just like we do. That is a really easy thing to say, but as we think that through, 
it, it doesn't actually even make sense, right? I'm paying more for milk in my household. The school pays more for milk. I'm paying more for paper. The school has to pay more for paper. And there's so much, only so much cutting and cutting we can do um, before it's felt by our students. Um, so I mentioned we don't have any fluff. The wish list doesn't have fluff. Um, and as far as professional services organizations go, because that's what we are as a school district, we are no different than one of the big six accounting firms. We're no different than McKinsey Consultancy. We're no different than a market research firm or a law firm. We, are, we don't make things. We're in the business of professional services. Um, there is no private sector professional services firm you will find that runs leaner than the Seymour School District. You will never find it, ever. Our teachers have a minimum of 20 clients that they deal with. Sometimes those clients are really little people, but they all have families behind them. At the middle school and high school level, our teachers are dealing with over a hundred clients. Nobody in professional services deals with that many clients with as little support in terms of specialists, in terms of supervision, in terms of ability to collaborate and problem solve um, with experienced people. We're professional services and we are lean. We're not a top heavy organization. So again, my ask of you all is to, is to help support us in kind of debunking these myths that again are super easy to say, but really are, are quite impossible to implement. Um, I want to leave you with just a couple of stats because probably one of the biggest statements that people like to say is Seymour spends too much on education. And again, here, if we look and we put ourselves, comparatively speaking, across other school districts in Connecticut, this is absolutely false. Um, our board chair, Chris Champagne, he is in transit tonight, but he's able to text me some statistics that he and Board of Finance um, and Finance Committee Chair uh, member Beth Nisgiriak pulled together. So I'm gonna share them with you tonight. Um, the way school districts are structured for analysis by the state, we are grouped into what's called district reference groups, DRG for short. DRGs are groups of districts that are roughly in the same socioeconomic um, status based on uh, median income, based on property taxes, based on ability to pay and several other factors. The most um, familiar district in our DRG to all of us is Wilkett, um, but there are 16 districts in total in Seymour's DRG. So if we rank those districts according to who spends the most on a per pupil um, basis, who ranks the least, we are ranked number 14 out of 16. 14 out of 16. And in the Valley, we rank fifth out of sixth. So of the six Valley towns, we rank sixth. Derby is number one in DRH um, GH, which is a level below us. They're spending $18,000, 554 per pupil. We are spending about 16,000 per pupil. And statewide, there are 166 districts in our little state of Connecticut. We rank on per pupil spending 146th out of 166. If that's not lean, I don't know what is. I don't know where you can cut unless we're striving to be at the bottom of the list. And I know that for my community, for my children, for my children's friends, um, for the people that I've grown to love in this town, I'm not striving to be last on that list. So asking here for your help in keeping a positive and collaborative conversation going as we strive to work together and come up with what we feel good about putting in front of the taxpayers of Seymour. So thank you very much. Bill, Chris Champagne is on his way back home. As Mrs. Harmley said, his son had to have an x-ray. So he'll be on the Zoom meeting as soon as he gets back to his home. Okay. Um, so is there anyone else, a uh, doctor from your board or staff or whomever that wants to give input? Yes, I would, Mr. Sawicki, Jim Garofolo. Go ahead. Thank you. You know, I've thought about this long and hard and I said, what is it that I could say to the Board of Finance that would have any impact? Because impact tends to make a difference 
in how people view the decisions that they have to make. Well, this is the best I can come up with. We are you, you are we. You and I, the Board of Finance, the Board of Education, we are the town of Seymour. We are the children's future. No one else has the ability to provide them the resources, the things that they need to move into the future and be the best of Seymour for tomorrow. So where do we go from there? I hope you will indulge me because I may not necessarily make my points very succinctly and it may take me a few minutes longer than someone else. I'm not an orator, so I'm going to try anyway. So please bear with me. We come to you year after year after year with hat in hand. And we ask you, fund the needs that the Board of Education has decided that is what we need for our district to provide the children the education worthy of them. Every child is worthy of the best education that they can receive in the community in which they live and for which their district, their town, city is willing to provide. Lim, you, in some respect, you have the community taxpayers at focus. You see, what are they, in your estimation, what are they willing to support? What are they willing to give in times such as these in particular, where inflation is rampant and is scheduled to become even more onerous for the local individual. And you have to take that into consideration. I understand that and I won't dismiss that. But I say to you as the chair and to whom I speak, your decision, your input to the rest of your committee will have some impact. So I'm appealing to you in a sense, even though I'm speaking to the committee at large. Seymour deserves to be treated in a way no less than any other community would treat their children. Give them the resources that are required to move them into the 21st century and provide them despite what they have lost and they have lost considerably over the last two years with this pandemic. So- The Board of Finance meeting, they're asking for money for the budget. I'm sorry? Budgeting. I, I'm really asking you to look at the broader picture. What can you provide us, the Board of Education, because we are you, you are we. We're one. We're not disparate. We're not two separate entities looking for something that doesn't benefit both of us. We're not doing that. We want the best for our children. They can't speak for themselves. I don't see any child on here amongst all the people attending this meeting. I don't see any of them, at least as far as I can determine that are willing to speak at this particular time. So I, as a member of the Board of Education, am trying to do that 
in some small measure for them. Anything that you give us in any way is going to impose a hardship, more or less on one or more families whose parents are out of work, whose parents are struggling to make ends meet, but yet education goes on. It doesn't stop. The pandemic didn't stop that. It didn't stop the teachers from having to perform their job. It didn't stop the Board of Education from having to pay and provide for those people the means of education for the children. So despite all the statistics, we have to do a job that we're entrusted to do by statute, by, uh, if nothing else, those of us who serve on the board, an inherent obligation as an individual to do the best we can for the children. So when we ask for you to support our need, we're not saying give the Board of Education, the nine members, what they're asking for. No, we are saying, please consider the effect that would happen and would be put upon the students of our district if we could not receive those funds, those resources that we need to give them what we are required to give them, what not just by statute, but by a morality that we're required to provide them. So I appreciate the comments that have come to you before from the superintendent, from our business manager, from our finance chairperson. I, I respect all of those things, but I'm looking to appeal to you and your committee on a much more base level that it is not simply a question of, oh, what do we give the Board of Education, but it's what, what do you, who are we, what do we do for ourselves and our community? Because if you don't see that as the greater issue, then you're looking at it as we versus they, and it's wrong. It should never ever be that. It should be, we are one. One for our children and their needs. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the board side that wishes to weigh in? I don't know if Jay would like to say anything or add. I know that uh, Chris Champagne will probably say something at the very end after the questions. Um, Vice Chair Jay and Ed, or do you have anything? I would just ask that you take everything that Dr. Compton uh, said in, in consideration. And, you know, obviously we understand it's a challenging time, but uh, I, I've sat in your seats and I know that it's not easy. So I appreciate all of your feedback and questions and I'm looking forward to uh, getting you guys as many answers as possible. Ed. Thank you, Jay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm fine with, and I support with my colleagues have said. Okay. Any anyone else uh, that would like to to weigh in or make a comment on uh, anything so far? Okay. I I don't I don't see I don't see anybody Mike unmuting themselves. So I'll I'll take that as uh, so far everyone is is content with uh, what everything is that's been said. From the board's perspective, I can tell you that in the you know, 12 plus years I've served on it. It's never been a, an us versus them. 
And I'll take exception if anybody ever says that. We're all, we're all here for the same thing. We've all, a lot of us have had, you know, kids go through the system. Um, I have a lot of, some of us have grandchildren in the system. I do, but to the, to the point of view, to the point of view of the realities of economics, well, there are, you know, considerations and everything that goes on with the board of education. And we understand that there's also, there is also a town with residents that a lot of whom aren't doing too well. And we are, let's say our board is going to try to do the best and fairest job that we can. I mean, no one is, no one is saying, uh, geez, you want 6.9? Nah, here's one and a half or anything, something on that order. Because we haven't had a chance yet to digest numbers. Uh, there may be some questions that some of our members have tonight. I have a couple, but you know, the, to kick to kick it off. But to everyone's point, we are all, or most of us that are on these boards and all, we're residents of the towns. We're taxpayers in the town. We get it. But as much as you know, looking after the children is paramount, and I don't disagree with that. We also have to look out for the residents of this town and a lot of whom are going through some tough times. So that said, the only thing I can promise in terms of this board at this stage of the game is gonna be to give a fair look at what's here. And we also have the other, I don't know, close to 20 town departments to talk to. And we realistically will need to see the impact and where all of this shakes out. Um, so that's, that's my, I guess that's my little soapbox uh, for the evening. But in, ter in terms of questions, one of which, one I had, I mean, I see the budget, I've got the budget book and I see all the numbers last year, this year projected, the, all those scenarios has whatever, anticipated attrition, and I don't mean laying off people, but has whatever anticipated attrition through retirements or people moving, teachers or personnel moving away, has that been figured into the numbers that we have in front of us? Uh, no, let me address that. Mr. Bucci can join me as well. Um, you know, basically with looking at the attrition, we have three staff members, they're uh, certified staff that are, are retiring. Um, so we also have in regards to secretaries who are retiring and we've also are looking specifically at those specific five positions. So we've calculated that amount. I'll let Mr. Bucci also address that. So that's, as I mentioned on the PowerPoint, attrition is something too that we have to look at if, if we can't get currently what we've asking for. Uh, this in the 6.9 includes these positions. Uh, with attrition, like I said, those are five positions at this time that we know with people that are basically all of these people are retiring. So, uh, Mr. Bucci, would you like to say anything in regards to that? We're also, we have some people that have been on one year um, ESSER grants. Uh, there were three teachers and also three tutors they won't be coming back. They were just for one year people during the COVID. So Mr. Bucci, would you address with the attrition calculation? Sure. Um, <clears throat> let me just preface it by saying that um, one of the, the certified staff that Dr. Compton referring to currently is paid through a grant. And the consideration that would have to be given to um, not replacing that person would be, would be, would we be able to replace that person in a grant with an existing staff member who would be able to utilize those grant funds in accordance with the 
provisions of the grant. Remember, one of the things we are we have to comply with is that we can't just move people out of our LEA budget and put them in a grant. Um, so to the extent that the function exists and is then borne by other staff members and added to the burden of their daily work because uh, we have to party people. It will increase. Then you have to, then you have the ability to reduce the burden on your local operating budget by virtue of replacing someone in a grant with someone who has departed. So we've given, we've gone through some, you know, scenarios, scenarios in which we've made assumptions that that is indeed the case. And if we were to be able to um, reduce the actual headcount in the operating budget through the retirement of certain staff members, and for those staff members who were being paid through a grant, we were able to replace the funds that we've currently been getting from that grant with other people or parts of other people, if you will, sharing of other people in a grant, then we would be able to reduce the ask from 6.9%. And we'd probably be able to get it down to 5.6 or thereabout. Um, and that would, I think, result in the elimination of, I think, Dr. Compton six um, personnel. Um, now, you know, I can't speak, obviously, because this is Dr. Compton's bailiwick. I can't speak to the impact of losing those six people, nor can I speak to how unpopular it might possibly be. But my job was to quantify for her um, basically what it is that it would look like in terms of a budget um, and what it would look like in terms of the overall ask. So again, we're, we're talking about um, roughly six positions that would take us down, um, you know, 1.3%, maybe 1.4% um, and get us to, you know, five, six, you know, maybe five, five um, in terms of an overall ask. Um, you know, part of this exercise gets lost in the, when you, when you start talking percentages. Um, you know, when you look at this budget and you look at the, the increase, the current increase is only at the 6.9% ask, giving effect to the $800,000 sort of carry forward issue. There's really only a $1.6 million increase in the overall budget. It sounds big when you start talking about percentages because, well, $1.6 million on a $35 million budget is not the same as $1.6 million on a $70 million budget. So, and you know, it, you, you, when you start to look at the positions and then you start talking in terms of dollars that you're able to, to reduce your budget ask by, you can very, it, uh, uh, you know, it takes a little while to get to $800,000, let's say, um, in terms of an ask or, or $700,000 in terms of an ask in terms of the number of personnel. You know, I mentioned, I made a comment earlier about the fact that it it, it's approximately a dollar thirty for every dollar that you spend in um, in in salaries, except that you don't get to pick the people who are on the benefit plan when you decide to make these kinds of cuts. So it doesn't necessarily wash out that way all the time because if the person who happens to be the person who is retiring or whatnot is not on the plan, then you pretty much get a dollar and some change with some minor tax issues, et cetera, but you don't really get the big hit, which is where you're going to save in your employee benefits. So it's just, again, it's not a parry pursuit situation where all things are being equal, um, but it would, we, we have given consideration, Mr. Sawicki, to the question that you've asked. Well, and as I said before, I'm not, I'm not asking in terms of how many people are you planning to lay off? What I'm asking is for those that you anticipate retiring who will not be coming back for whatever the reason, I would ask to get some figures in terms of salary and benefit costs that will be coming off the numbers we see in front of us, because I think that's a start. In relation to the $800,000 deficit, it's not a deficit. We're dealing with what the current insurance premium is going to be as best we can estimate it. If it's if it's twelve thousand, if it's twelve percent, okay. If it goes to nine, 
It's a little bit of a win if it goes to 15. We, right at this point, as, as you're aware of, we don't have a hard number yet. That's sure. why we're, we're waiting for our management administrator to deal with the insurance companies and see where this shakes out. But I do think for purposes of this board, meaning our, my board, that getting some numbers as to, let's call it anticipated uh, retirements or whatever you want to call it, discontinuation. Right. That's I think it's imp are. important because if you're, as you just said, if, if you're at six, nine and whatever numbers may be involved in these six people or five or however many are going to leave, it's going to impact salaries and benefits and whatever else. But I think, and I think our board needs to know that number because we, we're, lo we're looking at pretty much trying to see the, the, the reason, the most reasonable ask. And if we can factor in as best, you know, at the point that, well, you know, Mrs. Jones, a teacher, and I don't need to know names. You want to just tell me a position? That's fine. I don't care about names. But if we know that a teacher making, and I'll, I'll just make up numbers, a teacher making $80,000 is going to go, retired or whatever, you know, hit lotto, whatever the reason being that they're leaving, well, that $80,000 plus a pension effect, if they're, if they're involved at MERS, but if they're in the teacher's retirement, it's not going to help anything. Sure. But there's also a health insurance cost at some point, plus whatever else might be associated with that person. And I think that's an important item that we as the Board of Finance need to see. We have that very specific Person. data. And okay. uh, I, I would just like to make a point, you know, from my, uh, from my perspective here, you know, the budget that we sent over, and maybe this isn't my place to make this comment, but the budget we sent over was the, the budget that was approved by the Board of Education. And, you know, based on what comes out of this call and, uh, you know, uh, when my board will obviously reconvene and direct me um, as to whether they would like to submit alternative scenarios. Um, so that's why you don't have that in front of you at this point, um, because it, uh, this was the budget that the board approved that we would submit to the board of finance at the town. And, um, you know, and I, it wasn't, and I, and I understand that, but what you have here is a working document. Okay. And the final budget, however, it may come to be, whatever the dollars are, will be what gets approved by the taxpayers based on whatever the recommendations are that the board of finance puts together. So for, uh, I don't know your own internal policies and workings of your board, but as a working document, this is a good first pass. We've got a starting point. Now we wanna see based on, you know, the let's call it the retirement factor and anything else within any of these line items that you're aware of that may not happen or let's say doesn't necessarily need to happen, we'd like to see what those dollars amount to. We, we have worked on those calculations. We're just, you know, we, we've looked at three certified people that, as I said, are retiring. Okay. And definitely two, two secretaries, the certified people fall within just, just just a number off the top of my head. And that's when you, when you people are retiring, basically the three, because when you retire and you're going out as a teacher, you're in the course in the highest pay, pay scale. So, you know, looking at that, it's probably around $300,000 for those three people, but you well, have right. to understand. But just the, yep. the one thing I want everybody to understand is that that's taking away what we currently have and it puts burdens on other people. But I'm not saying that anything's not possible. And if something is different than a 6.9, then it would have to start with attrition. No, under, and understood. And, yeah. you know, unfortunately, in the economics as they are now, oftentimes it ends up being 
you know, doing more with less, but right. I'm not, I'm not going to let, I'm not going to, you know, it's not my place to, to lecture yeah. you or your board because you know, the drill too. And yes. there's no, and there's no reason, reason for any of that. But just to your point, your, your budget is two, 2.4 million increase. If you're taking out 300, well, you're down to two, one, there's an insurance component and whatever else there may be. So perhaps that maybe goes down a little less than 2 million or whatever it's going to be. But I think we need to have some numbers to at least get an idea of what's there. And, and on the other side, and on the other side of, of it, that I would only, I would only ask to only ask you to again, and I'm sure you've done it, but maybe, you know, a, a better magnifying glass. I don't know. Take, taking a look at some of the other line items that you have and seeing what's, what's a possibility. Now I know special ed's a moving target. It is, it was, and it will always be forever, but there are a whole other, you know, you've got various, you know, probably of the hundred plus line items you've got. I, you know, I would, I would think that taking a look at that or those, uh, I, I don't do well with grammar. My wife taught, taught English. Um, taking a look at those can also help because as I said, you know, we're all yeah. on the same side and right. we've got, you know, we've got a school system with a couple of thousand kids and we've got about another 14,000 worth of taxpayers or families. So we're trying to come to a reasonable estimate. Chris, Kristen, you had your, I look like yeah, you had your hand up. Thank you, yeah. Oh. Um, I just wanna build on, on the conversation we're having and, and assure um, you, Bill, and the Board of Finance that we have gone through all of those line items. So we have all of the backup, you all have all of the backup of the various components that go into our line items. So yes. we did not submit a budget to you all that just said, okay, let's take what we have and carry it forward. It was a very thoughtful process. The one thing that I don't think we had time to fully explore was exactly what your first question was, Bill, is what is the impact of six people retiring, theoretically being faced with lower price staff? That is something that we typically articulate for you all and we build that to our first budget submission. So we will work together as a board to make sure that that is reflected in um, the appropriate line items. But I, I wanted to assure you and the board that all of the line items and the backup have been analyzed um, and, and deemed to be necessary in our opinion, but we will go back and make sure that we've we haven't incorporated the impact of lower salaries on those six positions for the retirees we will um, modify those, those numbers. And, but I love the way you put it, Bill, that this is a working document um, and, and we know it is. Yes. And we will, we will revise as more information becomes apparent, like the health insurance, or like if we lock in that, that new contract with the bus company, some of these things won't happen for a couple of months, but that's okay, because our budget hearing won't happen until April either, so. One of the one of the other items, uh, and I don't doubt that you've looked through every line item mm -hmm. and you've devoted you, you know, you've done your due diligence and, and that. And from the board of finance perspective, I'm just asking you to take another look. Yep. Yes. I don't, which, I don't we think will. Is, which I don't think is unreasonable. Yeah. But no, um, right. also in terms of, you had mentioned that the arbitration award for the teachers was between three and 3.5%. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. What, that's, what, that's what's reflected in the, the, budgeted salary column, I guess. Yes. Um, if, if I may have the calculations for the professional staff, were they done by person in terms of who got a 3%, who may have gotten a three and a half percent, who may have gotten whatever? Yeah, Bill, yes. I could comment on that. Sure, go um, ahead. So essentially what underlies this model is a person by person calculation based on the educational level and the step that they would be moving into. And it is then tied to essentially um, an assumption page, if you will, in a model that returns to the model, the exact salary that they are entitled to pursuant to the contract. So it wasn't 
an arbitrary, say, give three here or three there. It was a very specific um, step and grade um, calculation that ties directly out to the model. And what I said earlier was that some of the some of the teachers who moved a step would have necessarily received say 3.2% because it happened to be that the jump from that one step to the next step given their educational level uh, returned a 3.2. In some cases it returned a 4.6% increase because um, that was the dollar figure then that step in grade. And then some other cases it reduced a lower percentage than the like three. Like a two point, right. Like a two point <laughs> something, right. So, but overall, when I, when I compiled the averages, it essentially came out to be 3.2%. And in fact, when we presented the teacher contract to the board of select people downtown, there was a summary page attached to the top that had been prepared by uh, the attorney for the board that essentially showed a summary that the um, average teacher contract increase this year was going to be, this, this coming year was going to be roughly 3.2. And then I believe the following year was about 2.95 or something like that. So these are all very, very specific numbers. That's, um, that's, that's fine because if for purposes, yeah. yeah, for purposes of this exercise, let's call it for lack of a better descriptor, um, specificity and calculation to the biggest chunk of your budget is what should be. And if you've already done that, then that's fine. Thank you. And if I could just make one other comment, you know, Bill, if you, if you look at page um, two and three of the uh, packet that we sent out, mm -hmm. you, you'll notice on page two, which is sort of the top half of our line items, you'll see where the um, 2022 budget and then the column next to it showing the increases over last year's budget is obviously fairly robust because that's your um, certified staff and your non-certified staff and your employee benefits and your infrastructure costs, et cetera. When you look at page three, you'll see a lot of blanks on the bottom in that column of the FY23 budget versus the FY22 budget. And as I said earlier, and, and to echo what Mrs. Harmeling was saying, we gave very great consideration to looking at holding the line on costs. And so for instance, if you look at transportation at $2 million and we are projecting a zero increase in transportation, yet we know that a transportation increase is likely coming down the pike when we renegotiate the contract, basically due to the inability of the transportation company to attract drivers at the rates that they're currently paying them, the decision facing the board is what to do with routes. Because if today's cost of $360 per run per day goes to $400 per run per day, obviously um, the math says you're going to have fewer runs if you have the same dollars. So I mean, that didn't go, I didn't need to say that, but anyway. Um, so. We, in, in, in going through this process, we looked at the costs that we have in spite of the fact that there, we know there are going to be some increases and said, let's deal with what we have to deal with as it relates to the educational side of the issue and provide for the teacher salaries, provide for the benefits we're required to provide, keep the lights on, um, do the re essential repairs and maintenance on the building at a very minimal cost. Uh, Tim Connors gave me a bare bones budget to work with. And essentially it's an emergency fund for when things go wrong. And as you probably well know, they generally do. So we really looked at this and said, we just don't, there's not a lot of room in this budget for us to provide for, for any kind of wish list, nor are we really feeling totally comfortable about the fact that we are going to necessarily be able to meet some of those rising costs without having to make some other very difficult decisions. I'm sure that if the routes were changed in town, that's not gonna be real popular because this year, dealing what we've been dealing with, with canceled routes and combined routes and, and the shortage of bus drivers, yes. our phones are ringing off the hook at times and as is the first select woman's. So they're looking for us to solve the problem. Dr. Compton and I were on the phone earlier tonight with a parent um, who we had to essentially 
say as best we could and as diplomatically as we could, um, there simply was no bus. And we don't own the buses. We don't employ the drivers. We can't compel someone to drive a route they don't want to drive. And so that is going to continue to be a problem so long as the bus company has a, a difficulty in, in, in getting drivers at a rate at which we can afford to pay them to employ. So, you know, I wanted you to just understand that Mrs. Harmeling's point and it was um, very well said in terms of what this board has already done in terms of trying to um, contain the costs in this budget. Um, because going into you with a budget proposal of 8%, um, we realize was just, you know, uh, you know, what do they say, a non-starter? Um, okay. So, you know, this, this budget really truly reflects what, you know, I represented to the board were the costs to provide the education. And um, that's why this was submitted. Okay. Uh Jim, I guess I, I guess that's your hand. You you want to say something? Yeah. You don't, or you want Chairman, to cover your lens up or something? Yeah, Chairman Sawicki, I'm talking about unknowns. I would like to address that topic. Um, we have an increasing number of migrants coming into the country, and they are being dispersed wherever the federal government despite, uh, decides that they should be. What would you reasonably, I, I pose this as a question, what would you reasonably expect Seymour Board of Education to do with the resources it has if it were, were to have a number of, um, let's say migrants who come into our district and required the specific resources needed for them because oh, I don't know how to say this without sounding um, inappropriate. I don't know. Um, how would Seymour expect to handle those students, young people coming into our district who needed special educational services. When we hadn't planned for them, they weren't part of our budget in any way. We never imagined we would have that need. What would we do for that? As far as your committee is concerned, if would we come back to you and say, we have an issue we never anticipated. How do we deal with that? Well, quite we honestly, we don't have the resources. Well, quite quite honestly, at this stage of the game, I'm not into dealing with hypotheticals. Anything, okay. anything, anything can happen. Were that to occur, for whatever the situation or reason is, then that would obviously prompt discussions involving the first select woman, involving the board of finance, and your board as well. And then a plan of action would be developed as best we can with the resources that may be needed. But at this stage of the game, we have a budget that you've presented and we want to get the best possible number out of it. Because hypothetically, we could raise your budget by $7 million just in case we were going to get flooded with people. But that's an unrealistic hypothesis. Yeah, but I wasn't looking for that, sir. I was looking for what do we do when a budget has been approved? Mm -hmm. And now we, we find ourselves as a board, as a district, having to deal with this concern. You mentioned in your opening remarks there, you mentioned what we could do, but would we be assured that the resources would be forthcoming in those circumstances. Could you say that they would be? As I said, I don't deal in hypotheticals and it would be what would those dollars that would be needed? And I would think were that to occur, 
people would be sitting down, probably starting with your board and doing some calculations as to costs and activities and et cetera. And then once a reasonable estimate was made, then that's when, as I said, our board, the first select woman's office, we get involved to see how do we, uh, let's say, make the fix. All right, well, I thank you for that. But I think anyone who thinks that that is not a real possibility for it coming might want to think twice on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I will turn it over to our board members. Are there any specific questions you'd like to ask? Uh, I, I can say from the perspective of from our board that we will we will wait obviously to see some different numbers uh, in terms of what what we've just talked about. And um, you know from that perspective, the only thing I would ask is if you, you know, go through and put your, let's call it new budget together or new numbers or whatever, that at least if you can put the numbers together by the categories you have on your current budget. So we know where the changes occur. So we don't and have also, to guess, we don't have to also, guess what line items and things. Right. And also we're going to work continuously on this 800,000 of where that we'd mentioned that in regards with the yes or two funds and looking yeah. specifically no, at what can, right to bring that down that amount as low as possible. So the next time we meet, we can give you the exact That's fine. numbers. That's fine. As I said, we, we are having, um, you know, we're having meetings with all of the departments through this month and probably the beginning part of March before we uh, call what we start, what we call deliberations, when we have all this, all the information in front of us. But um, you know, in, in that in that regard, uh, anyone on the board have any questions they'd like to ask, uh, Dr. Kamp? Rich. Uh, hi, how are you? All right. Um, so I have a couple of specific questions uh, in regards to the ESSER grants. Um, have you? gotten an exact dollar amount yet on that and have you worked those into every possible line item that could potentially be worked into with this budget here uh richard that's what we're doing right now um uh, today was very intense and uh the other day as well we are looking at that all of the s or uh, funds one have totally been utilized and zeroed out. Uh, we're looking specifically at ESSER two. Um, the situation then with the other ARP ESSER funds, which is the third grant, which is mainly dealing with HVAC and those type of areas with infrastructure. Uh, we're trying to look specifically at ESSER two, where that you can use certain salaries. Again, you can't uh, supplant, but you can supplement. And that's what in other expenses in related to COVID. So that's what we wanna come back uh, with those specific numbers of that we've looked at every line item, every individual looking at all grants in every way that we can. Our situation with the last grant has been so regulated in regards to infrastructure. So that's a situation to where that we're going to have to consult with the State Department as well, because we're very restricted with that one grant. But we will tell you that there have been at least $200,000 from that grant. We currently, um, that have been spent for computers for the high school, which was very justified. But we can come back tonight. I can't give you any but the exact amounts of what we've done the past few days. That's fine. I mean, uh, there are no expectations right tonight, nor do we mean to put you people on the spot. So if I could comment, uh, if I could just add to that. Um, yeah. The, in the course of what we've been doing over the last couple of days, looking at these uh, two grants, um, right. the grants, the way they were submitted, were submitted 
based on um, certain allocations. So what we've been looking at is a, a way in which we would essentially apply for a revision of the grant through the state of Connecticut to utilize the funds, uh, our portion of the funds in these grants for purposes other than what we had originally submitted these grants for. Um, now, there's every expectation that the state would approve that so long as it's consistent with the purposes of the grant. And right, that the do you want to mention? Yeah, the expenditures. Into some of those areas, so they'll yeah. see what we're what what can right. suffice. But you know they they're very sensitive to the issue of you again supplementing your expenditures and not supplanting your expenditures with the grant because you feel you need to move LEA expenditures into the grant to cure your inability to provide sufficient funds in your operating fund. And we just want to be very mindful of that well, because that's a, a, an area where the state gets very- um, Well, that, 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 main word, that main word is again, COVID related. If you can relate it back that it was, it's, it's a situation with COVID and it was necessary as long as it does, does not supplant, it has to supplement, it cannot supplant then, then it, it will work with revisions, with approval from the state. Okay, uh, so my next question. Could I just, could I just jump in one, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mr. Demko, but I just, I, I feel so passionate about this issue. It, it cannot be understated. So we have to be, language that, that sounds anything like, have you worked grant money into your line items for the budget? That's not language that we can even be using because we can't work grant money into our operating budget. So I, I don't I don't mean to beat a, a dead horse with that, but it's just so critical that no message ever be sent that sounds anything like, well, just use grant money to pay that line item because that's we, we can't do that. So thank, thank you for that. I, I apologize yeah. if I interrupted. Yeah, we, we have to stay within the regulation. I, I am aware of that, but and I no. did ask a question during the last budget cycle and was basically told that they would not furnish the information. I would like to see exactly where that grant money is going to go. Yeah, and that we want, yeah, we want you to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that that's a little different this this year than last year. Yeah. Now, also, if I may, I would like to ask if you can furnish the document that lists the provisions of what can be done with the grant money to this board. Yes, absolutely. And that's crucial as well. And also we would have the uh, stamp of approval from the State Department of Education as well. Yes, okay. totally. Yeah, I think that's totally justifiable because all of this has to be laid out so everybody sees exactly what areas are we talking about because it has to come from the grant and the grant would have to have certain revisions and it would have to be cleared. But there's some things that we looked at today that definitely fall under that with code revisions that could work. But the first step is to get approval from the state with revision. Okay. All right. So that's that that's good in that sense. Now, my next question has to do with energy um, and energy savings based on that Johnson Controls program. Um, has your energy line items reflected? the solar panels and the cost savings on the electricity. If I can comment on that. Yes. So when Johnson Controls came to the Board of Education on December the 6th and did a presentation, they, he gave a very cogent explanation as to what we should anticipate as being the economic fallout, if you will, of this whole project. And what he said that night was, you're not really going to see a savings in your utility costs. What you're going to, what you should do is you should budget as you had been budgeting based on your prior year usage, and you should add a 3% escalation factor to each year. So what we did for the purposes of this budget, 
was we took the 2018-2019 year as a base year. <clears throat> it's pre-COVID, it's pre-solar projects, et cetera. We added 3% per year cumulative. So in 2018-2019, the utility usage cost that year was 740,000. We added 3% per year for every year subsequent, including the 22-23 year, and we've arrived at a number of $833,000 for the budgeted amount in this budget that you have. To the extent that our costs to ever source are less than 833,000, let's say they're um, 533,000, we remit $300,000 back to the town to offset that portion of, portion of the bond cost and my understanding is that the guarantees that Johnson Controls was to provide would make up the difference. Okay, um, that's interesting because when they did their presentation to us, they touted these zero dollar a month electric bills and uh, you know the significant savings in energy. So I, I'm just really trying to put the pieces together there to see exactly how this program is benefiting everybody when we can't actually use the savings, so to speak, in line items such as energy costs here for this budget. So if I could, Mr. Demko, our, our board had exactly the same questions that you're asking. And so on the, on, at the request of the board, if you take a look at the budget document that um, the school district provided, uh, we have broken out line 622 into two lines. So line 622 previously just said electricity and embedded in that were the actual bill amount we paid to Eversource and then the amount that we gave back or however we wanna phrase it to the town. But we have now split that out. So now you see two line 622s. One is actual electricity costs and the right below that is what we're calling solar project bond payments, which is in effect what we've given the savings of, from electricity that we've given over to the town. So I, it's a great question and it's something that our, we as a board wanted to see split out as well. And, and it is in the budget document that way, which might lead to more questions for you. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I, I think I'm good with all of that. Um, you know, I, I'm just, where I am with, with all of this, and, and I understand the importance of education. You know, I have two children in the school system. My wife is a teacher as well. I get it, okay. However, I also have to look at the burden on the taxpayers as well, especially in this economic time that we are in. So coming to us with a 6.9% increase without even considering attrition and some of these other things. I mean, I would like to some, I'd like to see the numbers the same, you know, at what it looks like in a budget with attrition. Well, we've asked for, and we will get those numbers, Yes, obviously. Yes, you will. And that's fine. Cause this Thank is you. just, this is just the start of the process. That's all I have for this evening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any, anyone else? Betty Ann, Chris, Bev, Jim? Uh, Bill, I just had one question yeah, for you on ahead. the health insurance. Are they, are they renegotiating that contract or taking other bidders in for the health insurance or are we just going to stay with Anthem? Well, at this point, they're looking at the market. Let's call it that. Not necessarily Anthem, not just Anthem, but other insurance companies okay. um, locked in our, let's call it our broker is uh, involved in different negotiations and different scenarios and it's ongoing. I mean, it's, it, and unfortunately for us, I think it's probably not going to be finalized in the very near term, but it will be hopefully before, you know, we get this budget process over with. Okay. When does this contract go to, it goes to. It's been on a one year. A one year, okay. Yeah, so this is, you know, it'll expire June thirtieth. I, be I believe it. I believe it does. But they're looking at they're looking at prices 
starting July 1, which is the start of our new budget. So everything coincides. Okay. Okay. But they would have to get that into us probably a month before. Probably. Yeah. They, I mean, they have been, it's, it's, I don't anticipate seeing it in February. I'd be very surprised if we did, but uh -huh. if we do hooray. And then again, you know, depending on the proposals, there's also room for negotiation that I'm sure Anne Marie's going to conduct with them and see about getting uh -huh. the, the best bang for the buck. Okay, because that's a big number in. Oh yeah, in, it's, it's, it's in everybody's budget. number. Budget, yeah. So I think that's the number that we really have to look. At. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. All right. Any anybody else, Chris or Jim or Betty Ann? One last anybody? comment, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Go ahead. Jim Garofalo. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you. The sad truth is that we, the community, the Board of Finance, Board of Education, all the others, the taxpayers, they will never, ever realize exactly what the diminution of funding for their education has brought. Whether they were successful or they failed children, that's what I'm talking about, our students in the years ahead, they will never ever know what the effect was on your passage, your agreement, I will, of our request for a budget will produce. That's all. And that's the sad thing. We'll never be able to quantify it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have anything tonight? I mean, Betty Ann, go ahead. Real quick. And thank you earlier for asking. And Bev beat me to the punch. So I had the same question <laughs> with the insurance. And I oh. appreciate it. And I and right. I thank everybody here for the, the information. It's valuable, but I, I stand with Bill in saying that we're able to give everybody all the money we have. And this is a quote from Bill Sawicki, as long as we have it. <laughs> so there's I mean, just a lot to look at and thank you. And that's all. Thank you. We thanks, Betty Ann. We are all on the same side here. It's yes. just trying to fit the pieces in to where they best fit. Uh, if no one else has any questions or comments, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Compton and Mr. Bucci, uh, as well as the board, other board members who spoke out. Um, this is the first night of many for our board. And uh, <laughs> I, I, can, I can assure you that uh, we will be back in touch. And uh, we will, you know, wait to get the information that we've asked for from you people. So, um, watch our and, kids' videos on the on each of the schools' websites. And you can. Anne Marie, uh, I noticed you have. Do you have anything you want to add? Since I can see you're on. I'm just. I'm just listening, and I understand. <clears throat> I understand where the the board of that is coming from. Uh, as a taxpayer. You know, I, I, I look at how this is going to affect me as well, because we all have to pay taxes in this town. And we have to do what's best for our students. We have to put them first. And we have to also do what's best for our town. Okay. Thank you. All right. If, if, that's, if that's it, then, then I will uh, call, for, uh, call for an adjournment of the workshop. Uh, Motion to adjourn, Mr. Betty Chairman. Ann? Rich? Sure. Second, why not? <laughs> Situation normal. Nothing's changed. Nothing's thank, changed. Thank you, everybody, for uh, showing up. And board members, we will get to do this Monday night again. Yes, thank stay, you all very much. Stay thank safe. You. Thank they're, you again. They're, they're predicting icy weather, so be careful. Good night. Good night. Uh -huh.